would like to welcome you to the October AgriLinks webinar, which aims to answer the question, can small-scale irrigation empower women? We're excited to have representatives from the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for small-scale small -scale irrigation on hand to discuss some new research and insights from the field. My name is Julie McCarty, and I'm with the USAID Bureau for Food Security, and I'll be your facilitator today. Uh, before we get started with the content, I would just like to provide a few quick reminders. Uh, first, the chat box is your main way to communicate today. And thank you to everyone who has already introduced yourself. It's always really fun to see that we've got a global audience for these events. Throughout the webinar, we encourage you to use the chat box to network, to share links and resources, and to ask questions. We'll be holding most of the questions until the end of the webinar, uh, but we'll also have uh, our presenters engaging with you throughout the webinar in the chat box and attempting to answer some of your questions. We are recording this webinar, and we'll post the recording, the transcript, and some other resources to AgriLinks uh, within a week or two. And if you're watching the webinar right now, that means you are on the email list to receive a link to the recording. All right, a brief intro this time. Uh, I, we're going to go ahead and dive into the content since we've got a lot to get through. So to give our, an introduction to our speakers and to the scope of the webinar today, I would like to introduce Biniam Eob. Biniam is the Water and Irrigation Advisor at the USAID Bureau for Food Security and the Activity Manager for the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Small Scale Irrigation. So take it away, Biniam. Thank you, uh, Julie. We, so we need to make sure they're good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Uh, my role in this, part, uh, in this presentation is uh, to, uh, um, to briefly introduce the project and uh, introduce the presenters uh, who are going to delve uh, deeper into the uh, subject matter. Uh, the first presenter is Claudia Ringler from the International Food Policy Research Institute. She's a Deputy Division Director of the Environment and Production Technology Division, and she's the main lead uh, uh, from IFPRI uh, for the project. We have uh, Nicole Lafour from the International Water Management Institute. Uh, she's a senior project manager uh, uh, at the, in, at the uh, at in, in South Africa. We have Elizabeth Bryan, uh, same institution as uh, Claudia Ringler, who is a senior research analyst, uh, uh, who, and she conducts policy-relevant research on many uh, uh, themes, uh, such as sustainable agricultural production, natural resource management, uh, and others. We have also uh, Sophie Thies, who is a research analyst and a gender specialist at IFPRI also. So uh, you can read all of their bios will be in the, in, in the, in the presentation, so you can delve deeper into their uh, experiences. So with that, the first thing I want to introduce is the project, uh, uh, the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Small-Scale Irrigation. So sometimes you will hear us saying ILSI instead of the whole uh, nomenclature because uh, ILSI is an acronym that we are using for this project. Uh, as many of you know, uh, it's part of the Feed the Future initiative, which is not only USAID, but the whole of the U.S. government initiative, uh, about 11 government agencies such as USAID, State Department, USDA, MCC, and others. So as part of this uh, big uh, in, uh, 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 innovation, uh, as, as this initiative, uh, it, this project ILSI is a five-year innovation lab which is led by Texas a and University as the main implementing uh, organization with a wide series of research partners, including the three uh, CGIR centers, the International Water Management Institute, International Food Policy Research Institute, uh, International Livestock Research Institute, uh, as well as uh, one university in the U.S., which is North Carolina uh, A&T University. Uh, the project also collaborates with a lot of national research and engagement partners, including the University of Development Studies in Ghana, Bahardar University in Ethiopia, and Sakoine University uh, of Agriculture in Tanzania. Uh, the project has four components. Uh, the first component is the identifying of promising small-scale interventions. It, this could be from lifting technologies such as power to scheduling uh, of like uh, uh, drip irrigation. To, and second is to evaluate the potential and constraint of individual technologies, including gender. Third, identifying opportunities for scaling up. And last but not least is the capacity development and stakeholder engagement which means they have students coming to the U.S. to learn, uh, in-country uh, students uh, getting master's degree, as well as engagement with farmers and national universities. 
Uh, this slide that you see is very busy, <laughs> so I won't spend too much time on it. But uh, uh, it's, it's kind of an illustration how the project feeds, uh, fits within the Feed the Future uh, results framework. So as we know, uh, the Feed the Future results framework, I'll use the arrow and hopefully it works <laughs> for me, is that if you see it, I'm pointing with the green arrow, the main goal is to sustainably reduce global poverty and hunger. And the two main objectives are uh, inclusive agricultural sector growth, growth and improved nutrition. So the four projects, components of the projects that are highlighted in yellow here, around here, that you see, are one of them here and others here. They fit into the results framework to help achieve the two main goals and ultimately the, to sustainably reduce um, uh, global poverty and hunger. So this is my last slide uh, before uh, I, I, uh, I uh, uh, before Claudia takes over. So in general, the whole of the project has many questions, such as how much water is available, at what quantity, at what quality, how many farmers and households can be supported through small-scale irrigation, and so on. But one of the questions that the project asks is, what difference can irrigation make in terms of income, nutrition, and for women? And to help us answer those questions, we have Claudia, Nicole, Elizabeth and Sophie, who are going to take over uh, the presentation to give uh, to delve deeper into the subject matter. So, with that, I leave the floor to uh, Claudia. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So thank you, Minyam, for this great introduction. So I'll start with an overview on what women's empowerment actually means or could mean and why we believe agriculture water matters to women. Women's empowerment can be a somewhat wooly term for both funders and implementers. The graphic that you see here on this slide can, can hopefully help with the terminology for all of you. It basically lays out the continuum from reach to benefit to empower. Irrigation projects that aim to reach women attempt to include them in program activities such as irrigation training and extension on irrigation, for example, through a quota system. Donors now also often require reporting systems with sex disaggregated data to track how their funded activities reach women. I'm not naming any donors. Other projects aim to benefit women. You can see that in the second column here. By increasing their well-being, focusing, for example, on increasing their incomes through irrigation, or on improving their health and nutritional status through irrigation or other means. It does ensure that these outcomes improve at least as much for women as for men. The third type of projects, and that's where we focus on empowering, they go an extra step by strengthening the ability of women to make life choices through enhancing their decision-making power in households and communities. This can include working with community leaders and within households to change gender norms. How about water? Water is a highly gender topic because women have a broader set of more differentiated needs around water use including both domestic and productive water uses. And productive is what we mean with agriculture. Moreover, they have differential access to and control over water resources. And you know, what we have found, and you might have also seen in the field, very few technologies in the field have been developed with women in mind. So moving on on this technology challenge and issue, which is really very much at the heart of women's empowerment, what we have seen is a lot of the technologies are not priced or marketed for women. Women have often limited access to credit to afford or to buy these technologies. And even if they had access, they then don't have the equal access to land resources to actually apply and use those technologies. In addition, they face input supply and output constraints and have more limited access to training on such technologies. In sum, I think we can see a lot of constraints on the reach 
and benefit side of things. Given, given this situation, why should we use this extra effort to ensure that women can access, benefit from, and empower themselves through irrigation? The reason is that women's empowerment can have a very strong multiplier effect, influencing other development outcomes, such as improved nutrition and health, um, and many others through a whole bunch of different pathways, and those pathways you can, you, you can see on the slide. Key among these, you can see in the first column of various pathways, are production, the production and the agriculture income pathway, through which women can contribute to enhanced nutrition for all family members by making and taking their own agricultural production choices that improve household consumption or by spending the income earned from agriculture on healthier food. So if you go down further down, you see two additional pathways. One is the WASH pathway or water access pathway. So women who are involved in irrigation decisions may choose to use water in ways that improve the WASH environment. And finally, irrigation also has the potential to, in, to enable women's empowerment by increasing their leisure time or by providing opportunities to engage more in decision making at home and in the community. I hope this gave you a very rough um, overview on both women's empowerment and agriculture water use and the various pathways that we have seen. And I'd like now to hand over to Nicole Lefort from EMI in South Africa to talk more to us about the actual field interventions and insights from the field. Thank you, Claudia, and um, hello to everyone across the different time zones. So under the, uh, this particular project, we have, as IMI um, and also as North Carolina a and we have been field testing a number of packages of technologies across three countries, which is Ethiopia, Ghana, and Tanzania. And the technologies have ranged from manual, such as rope and washer, um, to solar, to drip, and we've also tested some irrigation scheduling tools. And men and women farmers have tried the technologies in their own fields uh, with guidance and some training from the project, but these were not necessarily on um, demonstration sites. Um, so we're actually in the field um, in sort of, you could say, real world conditions. The project collected gender disaggregated data across multiple disciplines on the field studies, and we also held regular reflection meetings with men and women farmers to learn from their experiences. So I'm going to present here. Oops, sorry, I'm trying to move the slides forward. I'm going to present here um, some of the preliminary results and lessons from the field studies. And I will try to emphasize some of the gender-related observations. So we know that small-scale irrigation is rapidly spreading across Sub-Saharan Africa, and farmers themselves are investing in technologies, especially pumps. We wanted to better understand the opportunities for small-scale irrigation and the entry points that could make it more sustainable and more equitable. In past projects, we've noted that a lot of the spontaneous adoption and the adoption by farmers themselves has been preliminary, pre predominantly amongst the highest uh, income earners in the rural areas. So this is what we have found over the last two to three years. So there's no significant difference between men and women farmers in terms of cost benefit or water productivity. And most technologies are economically feasible equally for both women and men farmers. And this is particularly true when it's high value crops. However, men and women do tend to choose to irrigate different crops. Farmers may not invest because they lack the capital to purchase the technology, but the technology is actually not the highest cost. Labor is. And this is particularly a problem for women who often have less cash and less access to family labor. Because of this, women sometimes use less water on crops because they don't have the labor for water application at the field. And this can result in lower productivity for women farmers, as well as lower incomes. The technologies are feasible on credit. We found a payback period of between six months to two and a half years across the various technologies, depending on the crops. Um, 
Now, women do face more challenges. Um, I wanted to provide a couple of examples here. Uh, one is that we found that women may be targeted by technology with uh, by a project for technologies, but the technologies then go to men once they're into, introduced into the household. So we saw examples where uh, we went in and provided, for example, um, pumps or a drip specifically to women, but when we went back, the men in the household um, were using it and um, claiming it at basically as their assets. And in this regard, it was very much like uh, large livestock in that technologies are considered men's assets. Yeah. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you for just one moment. I we can't. just want to make sure that we're on the right side. I, um, yeah. I know there's a little bit of a delay and there's been some internet. Everybody, Nicole joining us from, okay. uh, from South Africa is having some uh, we don't know if there's connectivity issues or not, but um, what slide it should be do you slide want to have 16, right now? What's the the technologies that are feasible, profitable, with multiple benefits. I can't see the slides. The slides are blank on my side. <laughs> okay, good. We got them for her. Okay, okay, no problem. Like I said, uh, everybody, this happens. Hey, can I just um, just have one minute? Um, so uh, you just tell us. Uh, Right now, we are on technologies are feasible, yep. profitable, multiple Okay, benefits. I will tell you when I want um, the next slide. How's that? You tell us. Yeah, and for all our participants, sorry, this sometimes happens when we have limited capabilities. Okay. Uh, but we will work through it. So, yep, just go ahead and tell us next slide, and, and okay. we will advance them. Um, another Nicole, example we found in the field was that men have higher access to information about irrigation and technologies. Um, in Ethiopia, we did a number of trainings on irrigation and on microfinance, so basically um, training people on borrowing and managing loans for irrigation. But what we found was that the extension agents and the trainers would call the participants by cell phone to inform them about the trainings, and women don't have cell phones usually within the house. So they're never informed about the meetings and trainings. So even in projects that attempt to target women, unless there's a way to directly communicate with women about the meetings, trainings, demonstration days, uh, women just simply don't get the information. OK, uh, next slide, please. So matching preferences, priorities uh, with technology trade-offs. So when we compared results across technologies, we found that certain technologies have a range of benefits. And these benefits go beyond a direct cost benefit or profit. And these can relate to incentives to adopt and continue to use a technology. And those also vary between men and women. So men tended to prioritize profit, but also labor savings. And women also prioritize profit, but they really prioritize multiple use. Now, multiple use includes saving time and labor, but more generally, and not only um, in terms of irrigating the fields. Women particularly valued the technologies that were installed near the household that could be used for domestic purposes as well. And some technologies increased labor for women. So women, for example, didn't particularly like the motorized pumps because they were often responsible for taking the pumps into the fields and carrying hoses into the fields. But that depends on the country and context and um, who carries and who's responsible for getting the technologies and managing them in the field is very local um, in, in terms of local context. So in a survey done, we also found that um, men and women both consider social benefits important in terms of which technology they want to adopt. And women noted that they like the technologies that increase status because it helps develop social networks which come with other benefits. But men also um, felt that social status was an important reason for choosing a particular technology to adopt. And these results about the trade-offs and the preferences of the different technologies is important for programming because these can affect uh, the incentives to adopt and continue to use a technology even if, after a project closes. But it also reflects the unequal opportunities and those that need to be balanced. So benefits might be aligned with a project's aims. For example, a rope and washer pump might have a lower profitability, but it serves multiple purposes. So in some cases, it might be useful to consider it in a wash project. And in projects that aim mostly for increased income or just uh, 
drastic increases in food production, then a motorized pump might make sense. So it's important to consider a matrix of benefits and trade-offs when looking at projects and programming. We can move to the next slide. So we also tested tools for improving water management on farm. And this is important because a lot of farmers that are adopting motorized pumps tend to overwater fields. They essentially flood as they would see happening with the monsoons. And so they consider flooding fields as appropriate for water use. But the results that from our studies showed that irrigation scheduling tools can help farmers better manage when and how much water to apply to crops. And in most cases, it actually decreased water use and improved uh, water productivity. And at the same time, it also increased yields and, it, and increased profit. We also saw uh, a reduction in nutrient losses. So the tools by showing when and how much water to apply can actually reduce labor. And women perceived this tool as having potential labor saving benefits. And another thing that's worth noting about the irrigation tools is that it can help with equi equitable access to water. The tools increase transparency in water distribution because it shows which farmers are overwatering and which need more water. So the tools are useful for schemes where you want to increase um, equitable water distribution. However, even with the irrigation scheduling tools, it's important to note that women do face the same types of constraints. They would likely need credit to purchase the tools. They would need access um, to information about how to use them effectively. So while women did perceive benefits for this and it can enhance equity, there are some constraints that have to still be considered. So if you could move to slide 19 on irrigated value chains. So part of analyzing the trade-offs and opportunities of technologies was looking at them in combination with different crops. And we worked with farmers to choose some of their own crops that they would produce, but we also did some where we would have consistent uh, production of the same crops. So what we were interested in is looking at the value chains that show the highest potential for profitability under irrigation. And one that we focused on with the International Livestock Research Institute was fodder. So we see fodder markets growing around peri-urban Africa uh, areas in Africa, but the fodder sources are shrinking. And a cost-benefit analysis showed that irrigated fodder can be profitable for both commercial sale, which is basically just taking the fodder directly to these um, fodder markets, but also for improving milk production or livestock fattening. And this can be beneficial for women in particular contexts where women control fodder markets or also where they control milk production and processing. And in addition to that, we found that women in the field interventions tended to interplant or only plant leafy greens. And a cost-benefit analysis in Ghana showed that the leafy greens were actually more profitable than the typically irrigated crops such as onion and tomato. And some men even began to shift to cropping leafy greens when they saw the women were actually making more profit. But this also points to a potential risk because irrigation used to intensify production and some crops then become more profitable. Men may take over crops that women tend to favor. So for programming and projects, this is an important thing to watch out for as um, you intensify that crop production and you have to consider which crops uh, that women favor and the reasons why they do so. So if we can move to slide 20 on microfinance. So this is the final slide on the field intervention results before I hand over to the next presenter. And I said, as I said earlier, the technologies and tools can increase profits and incomes and can have a range of other benefits. And even though the technologies are not the most expensive part, they usually require some amount up front uh, to purchase the technologies. So farmers need some type of credit. Now, generally, we find that the lenders are increasingly positive about irrigated farming more than they were even four to five years ago, because they also perceive that it's reducing the risk of crop losses related to weather. And we found that farmers are more likely to adopt technologies if they have access to affordable and reasonable loans. But there's an important caveat to that, because what we also found is that households where they have a fair amount of <coughs> female labor, 
don't take out loans to purchase mechanized technologies. So essentially a household doesn't seek out to mechanize if they have enough female labor in the household. So we also found that the group purchase of pumps could be a solution to um, access to credit. And a lot of projects are using this approach, but group size and dynamics are important here. Um, in Tanzania, where we tried the group approaches, there were a lot of problems of conflict and some of the people dropped out. In Ethiopia, we actually found that it went very well. And in one case, there was a female that was involved in one of the groups and she actually, um, the group managed very well as an intergender group and um, they are going on to purchase their own pumps individually now that they have been able to accumulate enough capital themselves. However, it should be considered um, in terms of the dynamics in mixed groups. Uh, generally, there's a very low capacity and low liquidity in rural finance, and microfinance institutions may not even lend enough to purchase technologies. So for example, in Ethiopia, there are cooperatives and microfinance institutions that lend up to a maximum of $75, but a motorized pump can be $250 or a solar pump over $400. So there are constraints in the size of the loans that uh, cooperatives and microfinance can actually lend. But more specifically to gender, uh, we find obviously that women have less access to credit, and this occurs at two levels, much like access to technologies and information and other gaps. Outside the households, women may lack requirements, the requirements to get a formal loan. And at household level, the rules around how decisions are made about borrowing loans and, and managing uh, different amounts of money can prevent women from taking loans. So I'm just going to conclude here on the farm level research. So we find a high potential for improving livelihoods for women and men farmers with a range of benefits incentives across technologies. But we also see a lack of equity at both household level and at other levels for women and men farmers to enter into irrigated production. And so what we conclude from the field studies is that understanding those differences can help us improve the targeting and projects that operate particularly at farm level. And with that, I will hand over to the next presenter. Thanks very much, Nicole. Um, this is Elizabeth Bryan. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us today and for sticking with us through all the technical glitches we've had this morning. Um, so today, um, I'm going to talk about how we are examining the relationship between small-scale irrigation and women's empowerment. And one of the ways that we're doing this is, sorry, let me switch my slide here. Uh, one of the ways we're doing this is by collecting and analyzing intra-household survey data um, in the project sites that Nicole has just described to you and um, also including some control sites as well. And the data that we're collecting, one of the modules is the Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index, or WEA, which assesses women's empowerment across uh, five different domains. And these include uh, production decision making, access to productive resources, control over income, community leadership, and time allocation. And within each of these domains, there are several different indicators. And for this particular purpose, we modified the WEA to include additional questions and response codes related specifically to irrigation. So I'll be presenting some of the baseline data in the next uh, slides. And soon we will also have completed a second round of this survey, including a second round of data collection for the WEA in all three of the countries. OK. So baseline results are showing us that small-scale irrigation is not always associated with women's empowerment. So here in this table, you can see that women, women from irrigating households in Ghana and Tanzania have higher WEA, WEA scores than women from households without irrigation. But the opposite is actually true in Ethiopia, where women from uh, non-irrigating households have higher WEA scores. And you can also see that in each of the countries, the factors that contribute to women's disempowerment are different. 
In Ethiopia, we see that community, community leadership is more of a challenge than it is in Ghana and Tanzania. While in Ghana and Tanzania, other issues such as credit access are more important uh, determinants of disempowerment. So what this suggests is that interventions, such as the introduction of small-scale irrigation, doesn't necessarily directly lead to women's empowerment unless these interventions are implemented in a way that considers how not only to reach and benefit women, but also to provide opportunities for women's empowerment. And Nicole already talked about how many of the constraints that women face are context specific. So um, approaches and interventions that aim to um, facilitate women's empowerment need to keep these specific uh, context um, relevant factors in mind. <clears throat> so now I want to dig down and focus on some of the specific components of the way or some specific indicators of women's empowerment. And I'm going to focus on uh, the questions that we added to the WEA related to irrigation. Uh, one thing that we find in the data is that women seem to be somewhat less involved in decision making about irrigation in Ethiopia compared to Ghana and Tanzania. So what's interesting is that while women and men in Ethiopia across many different questions tended to report higher levels of joint decision making and joint ownership of assets, when we ask about input into decisions such as those related to irrigation, which is shown here, we find that women are more likely to report having input into only some decisions. And in the next slides, you'll see um, in Ghana, we see a higher percentage of women being involved in uh, most decisions, and, and several are involved in, in all decisions related to irrigation. And in Tanzania, again, we find uh, more women reported being involved in all or most decisions related to irrigation. In terms of ownership of irrigation equipment, we find that men and women both tend to report that men are more likely to own irrigation equipment in Ghana and Tanzania, although, as you can see, there seems to be some disagreement between men and women in these two countries, uh, where men don't tend to acknowledge women's ownership and while at the same time some women are reporting that they do have ownership. So there's some sort of discrepancy there in terms of how men and women are reporting to us. Um, in Ethiopia, both men and women report higher joint ownership of irrigation equipment. But as I mentioned, you know, as with decision making, it's likely that men tend to have more control over the equipment even when they're reporting uh, joint ownership. And Sophie's going to talk more about this in her presentation. <clears throat> While this indicator is not used in the calculation of the WEA, we did also collect uh, gender disaggregated data on men's and women's access to information, including information about irrigation. And we did this because, as Nicole mentioned, um, we found that access to information is critical for sustained adoption of technologies and practices across many different contexts. And we find that in these other contexts, women tend to be much less likely to report having access to information on irrigation. And we find that here as well in the, the three countries um, in ILSI. So interestingly, we also see that both men and women in Ghana and women in Tanzania have particularly low levels of access to information um, relative to men and women in Ethiopia and men in Tanzania as well. So this is a real constraint across all of the countries and for men and women, but particularly uh, for women. And just to summarize, um, women's empowerment is not a guaranteed outcome of development interventions. All interventions, including small-scale irrigation interventions, need to be intentional about how men and women are reached, how, and how they're engaged in activities. And this needs to be done in a way that takes uh, men's and women's unique roles in agriculture within a particular context into account. And it also needs to consider the particular challenges or constraints that women may face in that context. 
um, ensuring that all uh, interventions are more gender sensitive has the potential to lead to other positive development outcomes, as Claudia showed with her earlier slide on the pathways um, to improve nutrition outcomes. And so this is an area that we're currently exploring through our research. And um, when we finalize the second round of data collection, we'll be able to observe if um, in all of these sites, if there have been changes in women's empowerment that have taken place, and if so, what are the key drivers of these changes? Uh, before we move on to Sophie's presentation, I also want to point out that the literature and our own qualitative research shows that there are other factors both within and outside the household, apart from the WEA, that are particularly relevant for examining the relationship between irrigation and women's empowerment. And important factors within the community include things like the availability of natural resources, like water and land, um, social and cultural norms, such as inheritance patterns, and community infrastructure. So you know, is there a, an irrigation scheme available for people to tap into? At the household level, other important factors include the type of marriage arrangement or family size or idiosyncratic shocks that people may experience, such as the death of a family member. And all of these other factors are as important for women's empowerment, um, but they don't fall under the five domains, so uh, which, you know, these domains tend to focus more on household dynamics of decision making and control over resources. Um, but we do need to control for these additional factors in our analyses of the data to make sure that we're accounting for all of the factors that are important for empowerment um, in this context. So now I'm going to turn it over to Sophie, who's going to talk more about some of the findings from our qualitative research. OK, thanks so much. Thanks so much. Um, so, so far, in Oh, thanks. Okay. So, so far in this presentation, we focused on the unique and disproportionate barriers that women face to adopt small-scale irrigation technologies. Unfortunately, these gender-based constraints to adoption are not the only source of inequality that they face. Um, because the majority of rural women live in households with other, usually male, decision makers, there are also challenges within the household that keep women from benefiting equally from agricultural technologies, including irrigation. I'll focus here in the next couple of slides on specific challenges within the household that may keep women from uh, being reached, benefiting, or empowering themselves through small-scale irrigation. So let's Drawing on a classic definition of technology adoption is not just a single event that happens all at once, but really as a sequence of three phases. The first technology, and then the phase of continued adoption. Um, in continued adoption, what happens is that the farmers decide whether to keep using the technology based on their direct personal experience of costs and benefits rather than what others have told them to expect. And most of the constraints we've talked about so far focus on the first two phases, why women are less aware of, of these technologies and how to use them properly, um, and less able to actually purchase, try out technologies. But gender is also important in the continued adoption phase. Um, we don't see so much focus to this phase, maybe because we see uh, two opposing assumptions. Uh, sometimes we see the assumption that either you know, all household members experience the same costs and benefits related to a technology, or conversely, there's a diff different assumption that only the adopter of the technology will benefit and no one else in the household. But this binary seemed rather unnuanced. <laughs> so through You'll see qualitative research we conducted in 2016 in Ethiopia, Ghana, and Tanzania. We explored intra-household issues around irrigation technology further. And through this research, we ended up developing a conceptual framework to help understand the costs and benefits during continued adoption related to irrigation technology. Um, so, 
this conceptual framework unpacks you know, the continued adoption phase after the technology has been acquired and is being used by the household. Um, and in the, so in this phase of using the technology, it highlights four rights to the technology. The use right, management, fruit juice, and alienation. Go into these in a moment. The point here of the framework is that if we look at who within the household holds each of these rights, this is a better way to understand who's bearing the costs and benefits of the technology rather than assuming they're shared equally by everyone or exclusively by one person. So here's a quick definition of each of the rights. And you can refer to our IFPRI discussion paper that's out on this for more detail. All right, the use right, pretty clear, it's the right to physically operate the technology, lay out the pump, operate the motor. The management right is the right to make decisions about how, when, and where to apply the technology, for example, on men or women's plots of land. Fructose is really important and has not gotten a lot of attention. This is the right to control the outputs and the profits from the technology. For example, controlling the income uh, generated from the sale of irrigated production. Um, and this is pretty key. We'll return to this in a second. And alienation is the right to sell, lease, give away the technology. Um, I'll share a few of our research findings related to what we've learned about the distribution of these rights to small-scale irrigation technology. First of all, it became very clear that these rights are rarely all held by one person in the household. There's always some kind of distribution between household members. And this has two important implications right off the bat. First, women are often much more involved in irrigation activities than we may assume. Um, and, if, and, and the second thing is that if projects try to transfer irrigation technologies to women, for example, giving them motor pumps directly, this may not always work because intra-household dynamics often reorganize who controls what rights. This is similar to how if you reach women, for example, reach them with a motor pump, that doesn't necessarily mean they benefit or empower themselves through the use of that pump. Um, and to investigate who holds which rights, it's useful to look at the type of technology, mechanized or manual irrigation technology, and land rights, who's controlling what, which plots of land. Um, in our research overall, across the countries, men were more likely to hold rights to mechanized technologies like motor pumps. Um, women, in contrast, usually only held use rights, but rarely fructose or management rights um, over motor pumps or mechanized technologies. And this might strike you know, a little bit strange. We might assume if you use the technology, you get to control the benefits. That's sort of what works in you know, our context. But this is not often the case for women. So it's a mistake to conflate use with um, some of the other rights. And I will explore why this is in the next couple slides. So for the use right, you know, one of our questions in the, this research, we asked women, how are women irrigators perceived in the community, thinking they might be seen as innovators? Instead, women told us they're seen as suffering. They see it as hard labor for little reward. Um, and so this reflects that the use right is just labor if it doesn't come with other rights to the technology, like fructose or management. Um, furthermore, a group of men in Tanzania explained that, this is a quote from them, agricultural responsibilities are for both of us, husband and wife. The only activities which we differ are household chores, whereby when we reach home, she is the one cooking as I am resting. But in agricultural activities, the ratio is 50-50. And of course, if you're doing 50-50 agricultural work on the family plot of land, plus 100% household chores, that does not leave a lot of time for irrigating on your own separate plot of land which women often maintain. Um, so men and women both told us that women need to prioritize their labor on domestic work and on plots of land that men control before investing in their own plot. So if women are using mechanized irrigation, it's usually on men's plots or on the family plots, not on plots of land that, that she really controls. Um, and so women cited this time burden, you know, needing to fulfill these other obligations is one reason why they were not able to irrigate plots that they control. Okay, let's talk about the fructose rights, which uh, in contrast were most valued by respondents. By respondents. Um, 
And it became very clear that you know, just because you're using a technology does not at all guarantee uh, your fructus rights, the rights to the profit of the technology. Um, and this is really largely because women are using this technology only on men's plots of land. So this then begs the question, you know, why do women not control income from these jointly managed irrigated plots, from men's plots? Um, there's obviously a number of different reasons. Um, I'll highlight one challenge that emerged from our research, which um, happened with, uh, with commercializing irrigated produce, with irrigated rice paddy in Tanzania. Um, men started selling this irrigated rice paddy to warehouses uh, at a distance from the community. And women described how information is asymmetry. You know, their lack of knowledge of what's going on in these warehouses compromised their fructus rights that they used to have over this. Some quotes from women. On ownership, it's my husband because he signs the sacks at the warehouse and even sells. But you won't know of the amounts whether he gives you a fake calculation, you just have to accept. You can't go daily to check them since you aren't the one who signed for it inside there because his fellow men will think of me oppositely, so I just remain at home. And so even though women acknowledge that the prophets helped them to build good houses, um, they were not happy to lose their fructus rights over a crop that they equally helped to produce with their labor. And they were told not to complain because they were provided for. So, Please do read our paper for more detail, but here's a few ways we can try to apply this framework um, and address constraints within the household in our efforts to diffuse small-scale irrigation technology inclusively. Okay, first of all, there's some do's and do nots, starting out with the, the, the do nots. Do not assume the adopter controls all the rights to a technology or that the rights are shared equally. Um, investigate these four rights, the um, use, management, fruit juice, alienation, and then you'll be able to better see um, the costs and benefits borne out within the household. Second, do not assume that use rights convey fructus rights. They're, it's easier to measure who's using a technology, who has uh, the, you know, received the technology, um, but people really value the fructus rights and those don't get measured um, as, as much. Both are important to measure, so you can get it you know, at labor um, and control over income. Okay, some more constructive, positive advice. Do investigate how expectations about the distribution of rights affect incentives, especially for women to adopt technology or participate in a project. As you can see in the graphic uh, framework, there's an arrow that goes from number three over to try out, indicating that the um, you know, women know if they're not going to get fructus rights, that might uh, seriously reduce their enthusiasm for participating in your project. Um, do seek opportunities for time saving. This is a huge issue for women, especially when it doesn't come with what they consider an adequate kind of payoff. And do support, most importantly, women's fructus rights. Um, you can do this, you know, either through shifts in uh, intra-household relations, there's lots of programs working on household dialogues, trying to shift gender relations within the household, um, and or working outside the household, um, like helping women acquire land um, with, in women's groups separate from their um, own homestead. And the type of technology and land rights matter. Okay? All right. So now we'll pull back and show our concluding slide with a few top takeaways from the ILC gender work that we've presented so far, and we're looking forward to discussion on this. All right, I think these are going to fly in. Number one, oh, okay. Number one, reaching women, so going back to the reach, benefit, and power concept that Claudia mentioned, reaching women with small-scale irrigation definitely matters. There's a big gap right now. Um, and we've shared a here a few approaches to diffusion and to the design of technologies, credit um, that can better meet women's needs and actually reach them. That's not even effectively happening right now. But reaching women is not sufficient. It's not the same as benefiting or empowering. Um, if we were only to measure women's technology adoption or use of technology, that's just measuring if we reach them, um, but as I've just discussed, there are many constraints within the household for women to actually benefit from irrigation technologies. 
Uh, but there is a lot of potential for uh, small-scale irrigation designed and disseminated properly to reduce women and men's workload and really increase income and resilience. And this can be the basis for empowerment. And it's definitely worth um, experimenting and learning more from each other going forward with programming. Um, to do so, we definitely need to leverage opportunities for time savings via small-scale irrigation. This doesn't happen automatically with every type of technology and crop. Um, the irrigation scheduling that Nicole mentioned is one example or um, uh, technologies that meet women's multiple uses of water can really reduce work burden. Number five, um, to help overcome constraints to awareness, we do need to provide women equal access to information on technologies. The awareness gap is, is definitely present um, and how they can invest in these technologies productively. And this might mean that they're doing so jointly with their husband. It might mean independently. I think we're kind of, ag that's sort of context specific. We're agnostic on that. Um, number six, finally, small scale irrigation almost always affects gender roles and relations. I hope this is, this is probably the um, most important thing we want to communicate with this presentation, um, uh, that gender roles and relations will almost always be affected by small scale irrigation. So let's pay attention to this. We need to collect sex aggregated data if we want to understand technology's impact on different people. And we need to involve men and women in the design of technologies and diffusion approaches from the beginning. So thanks. That's all I have here. Great. Thank you so much to all of our presenters for your excellent and thorough presentations. I really like these top takeaways. I think they're very useful. So I hope that um, all of you joining on the webinar will also let you let us know if these top takeaways resonate with you, if you think that they will be useful for your work. All right. Well, we have um, some time now for questions and answers. We've been collecting the questions that have come in along the way. Um, and so we'll run through them. And we encourage you to continue those questions. Uh, in the chat box at any time, and we'll get through as many as we can over the next um, 30 minutes or so. All right. So first up, we'll uh, we'll kind of go back towards the beginning and ask a question to Claudia that came in from Indra Klein. Uh, while training can be designed and provided to women, how is the regional industry, namely men, being educated to be more accepting of women? Yeah, just you know, very quickly. Taking together with the that talks about uh, is awareness. So this is really goes together. If you go back to the very original slide that I showed, we talk about reach, benefit, and empower. So we do, I mean, as is shown here, we do need to start with reaching women um, by informing them about the technologies, informing them on how to get credit for the technologies. But as soon as we move towards benefit and empowering, we actually have to make sure we talk to women and men. In fact, we always want to talk to both women and men. And if we actually want to move towards empowering them through irrigation, we have to make sure that we don't just talk to women and men in the households, but that we also talk to the communities and the needs of the communities. Because the, the long-term goal is that we change gender norms, understanding that women's decision-making over irrigation improves outcomes for everyone, not just for the women, but for the family, for family health and nutrition. And that's something that all men want. Each man in a family wants strong, healthy uh, children that thrive, that have you know, better opportunities for future income earnings. And that's the same with the community needs. So I think the goal is that we don't stop at you know, reaching women with some training activities, but that we move beyond and reach out to the communities and that we reach out to women and men. And that's really a main approach that can make a very large difference here. And uh, Indra also asked a follow-up question, um, which was, additionally, what steps are being taken to raise awareness with larger entities that may rely on small stakeholders serving in the supply chain, or, or smallholders serving in the supply chain. Yeah. yeah, OK, maybe just to follow on. In fact, something we didn't talk about here in the PowerPoint is we implemented three large irrigation gender trainings that were focused at government agencies and implementers of irrigation projects in the three countries, Ghana, Ethiopia, and Tanzania. Uh, we had a very you know, strong turnout and strong positive feedback. And there's a lot of materials that can be used 
uh, that were developed for those trainings that can be used to reach out to you know, additional uh, agencies and implementers and even funders. So those materials are available for everyone and we believe you know, that we do need to have this training, provide this training because a lot of the terminology sounds challenging to the traditional irrigation engineer who's implementing these projects. And I think that's what we need. We just need to increase capacity on the topic. I think you know, the focus of this uh, research and this presentation isn't so much on the role of agribusiness, but it sounds like your question is you know, curious about that. Um, uh, there, there does seem to be, you know, based on this research, uh, a business case to be made for um, better and more inclusively disseminating irrigation <coughs> technologies to both men and women. Um, so we've you know, seen cases of um, agribusiness companies working in Africa that are actively um, uh, disseminating irrigation technologies to save time and make their <laughs> contract farmers more productive. Great, thank you. I think we will um, we'll skip down to a question that came in during Elizabeth's presentation from Emily Miller, sorry, um, which was uh, about the WIA scores. Are the WIA scores significantly different between those who use irrigation and those who don't? Is that something that you were able to observe? So the WIA scores that I presented are the population-based measures. And my understanding is that you can't look at the statistical significance uh, the difference between those two measures, but I think there are other uh, indicators that you can do that with, like the 5DE would be one. So that is something that we're planning to do, but the table that I showed you have been muted. did not calculate the statistical uh, Your microphone has been turned on. Scores. So, but I, I have talked to the people that created the WEA and that create the index, so we will look for ways to look at the difference between the um, individual WEA scores. Great, thank you. And uh, Nicole, a few questions came in for you from Indra Klein. And um, I think we'll, we'll go to the second one that's here on our list first. Uh, has maintenance and management of equipment been a deterrent for women? If not, are there any data on whether there is a different pricing for repair and maintenance where women owners are concerned? OK, so a little bit of I hope you can hear me, because I am having some issues with connectivity. How that could affect women. Um, okay, good. So in the various interviews we did, and we would always ask about constraints, there was never any mention by women about um, access to maintenance. Um, and also there wasn't any mention of differential payments uh, or prices for women and men. In the cost-benefit analysis, we know that men and women both pay the same for other inputs and for all of the services and uh, for uh, daily labor. So on the one hand, there isn't any reason to believe that um, it would be uh, more expensive for women than men to, um, you know, that they would be charged more for that repair and maintenance. However, I think it's an interesting point because women often have less mobility so they won't necessarily have a bicycle or there may be some social norms around uh, traveling alone. And in most cases also, they would be taking equipment for maintenance in, you know, it could be even as far as a district capital. So we could see there some issues arise about women accessing repair and maintenance. Now, one of the potential solutions to that is um, a service provider model where you would actually have people who repair pumps but actually go to the field to repair them at the household or within the field itself. And we're seeing this pop up in other, you know, in places where um, they're providing, you know, service provision around well, the pumps themselves for one, but also providing fuel or, you know, providing some types of other type, you know, other kinds of support, um, not necessarily repair and maintenance yet. But we could see the potential for a um, service provider model here that could be a really good opportunity and would help to address those issues around mobility. But I do take it as an important point, and um, I appreciate that you've, you've raised that. Great, thank you, Nicole. 
And we'll go to another question for you, um, which was, given challenges regarding financing for women, do you have any thoughts on how... Yeah, I think that there's ISC an important thing to, to state here, which is that microfinance actually has very about. limited reach in rural areas. And, you know, one of the indicators that we looked at or one of the variables we looked at was proximity to any source of microfinance. And it, it's extremely low um, in all countries that we are working in. Um, the other thing is that um, the women focused microfinance institutions and the financial service providers often don't reach rural areas at all. And they cite the high transaction costs of operating in the rural areas and also high risks and they prefer to lend to women for trading. So there is a lack of incentive there for some of the lending um, agencies uh, to be involved in targeting women for irrigation technologies. Um, also, it's important uh, that the range of rates, uh, interest rates, and the terms and conditions provided by different microfinance institutions. Um, oftentimes, the microfinance institutions that are women-focused charge higher interest rates than cooperatives or informal sources. So, for example, in Ghana, the interest rate through a formal microfinance institution can be more than 50% a year. That's extremely high, and that's one of the reasons why the farmers prefer to go to a local cooperative or an informal source. So. I think one of the key issues here is how do you create an incentive for a microfinance institution, though they're targeting women, to take on a higher risk and a high transaction cost to try to reach women in the rural areas. And we just don't really see much of a priority put on that by the microfinance institutions, even if they are women focused. Very interesting, thank you. Certainly if anyone on the webinar has experience with microfinance institutions and wants to chime in on what you've seen, um, that would be fantastic. And actually it looks like Ruth has put in a comment in that regard. Um, yeah, it's very, very interesting. Thank you, Ruth, for sharing that uh, perspective. Uh, all right, so um, now we'll jump down to, uh, let's see. All right, a question that came in from Sudhir Yadav, uh, which actually also came in during your presentation, Nicole. Is there any behavior study to understand why men give priority to labor savings technologies while women look for multiple use technologies? If women are seen as labor in the society, in the society yeah. they might give priority to technologies to reduce, reduce their... Well, and in, in there's a way in which you can look at this and understand it as the same priority, because women are giving priority to multiple use technologies because it saves them labor. Men are doing it because it saves labor for irrigation, but women want multiple use options because it saves them labor not just for irrigation, but also for collecting domestic water, feeding livestock, um, you know, household water needs, basically. So there's a way in which it's both about reducing labor. It's just that women approach that reduction in a different way than men do. Um, and there is a clear indication from the, um, the qualitative research that um, there is an interest in reducing drudgery. There was a very interesting case in Ghana where one community had a high level of out-migration of women, actually, to provide labor along the border with Burkina Faso in agriculture. And the men in that particular community really focused on ways that they could get technologies to reduce drudgery for both domestic and agricultural purposes, specifically for women, because they felt that it was important that women weren't really pushed to or forced to migrate um, uh, to help the household income. So I think that there is um, some similarities there between both men and women about prioritizing labor saving. They just have a different entry point to do that. Um, and I think that where the incentives are right, um, men do also prioritize reducing drudgery for women. Um, it, it just depends on the local incentives in that particular case. Excellent, thank you. 
And as all of you can see, we just put up a slide on our screen um, with just some coming attractions in November. Uh, so we just wanted to make you aware of these. We'll keep going with questions. Um, but uh, for one point, we will be holding a continued discussion on AgriLinks stemming from this webinar. So if you have further questions or just want to engage a little bit further, share some resources, uh, we'll make sure you have that link to, um, to click over to our discussion. And we also have a few webinars coming up. Uh, a webinar next week on strengthening civil society's role in development, focusing on the Feed the Future Civil Society Handbook. Um, and also we have a, a, a gender focus on AgriLinks in November. Uh, so we're putting out a call for uh, lots of resources, stories, blog posts, et cetera. If you have mm -hmm. anything to share related to agricultural development and food security, um, you can post it directly on AgriLinks or get in touch with us uh, through email. And also, just to flag uh, next week there, or no, that is actually later this week, um, a special land links webinar on the business case for land rights. Um, we'll make sure you have that link in the chat box as well. Okay, so on to a few more questions. And let's see, we had one come in uh, during Sophie's presentation, uh, also from Indra Klein who wanted to ask about movements among women to come together and begin change to renegotiate contracts that provide more benefit of technology, especially with the use of mobile tech and social media as a galvanizer? Wow. That's quite a question. I think you should lead the way. <laughs> um, so I don't know about the use of mobile technology and social media for this purpose. We do see, though, um, and often organically, women on their own initiative forming groups to um, either purchase or rent land uh, along an irrigation canal in order to irrigate, um, or c come together, as some examples as Nicole mentioned, um, and collectively purchase um, irrigation pumps. Um, I think the point is that you know irrigation is quite transformative. It allows you to often produce a whole other harvest um, and you know assure your production despite increasingly variable rainfall, um, so, and often shift to higher value crops. So it's you know, quite valuable to people, and um, women you know, value this as well. Um, so an you know, example that I saw was in, in Ethiopia recently, a group of women had taken credit from the uh, local like, Women's Credit League and to rent land um, along an irrigation canal, which uh, was just women, women run. They did this because they, uh, <laughs> this was a way for them, a strategy for them to retain control over all of their earnings and production, um, despite the extra labor burden. So uh, it would be great if, there may be movements going on that I'm not aware of, um, and it'd be great if organizations could be supportive of women's groups that are taking the initiative on this going forward. Uh, great, thank you, Sophie. Uh, let's see, I think we'll, we'll jump to a question uh, from Emily Miller that I thought was interesting. Are efforts to get women's input on priorities and design uh, being sustained? I've only seen one project to date in this regard. So I'm assuming that she means you know, getting input from the beneficiaries of a project about what that project is going to cover or what the priorities are. Um, have you seen that in this particular realm? I mean, maybe to add there, I mean, to make sure that these efforts are sustained, you, you know, you need a whole uh, bunch of impact pathways, and one impact pathway that we have used in Ethiopia is to directly work with the Agricultural Transformation Agency, their gender expert, who is actually feeding in our results into policy documents, you know, to ensure that all efforts in Ethiopia on household irrigation um, you know, are beneficial to women and not just, you know, again, from reach to benefit to empower. So, you know, that's one impact pathway that you actually try to go up to the policy level at the, you know, with the national government and make sure that this is enshrined. But of course, as we know, you know, even enshrining uh, such, uh, yeah, enshrining gender in uh, policy documents doesn't necessarily mean that we then actually reach women, uh, reach women, empower them. Um, so we have to work at various levels, and again, as we mentioned before, we have been doing this gender irrigation trainings with agencies and actually technical people who directly uh, implement projects. 
then we have to you know, work again at the community level, uh, talking with community leaders. But I think another an issue that you also raise by posing that question is, at what extent are we able to go back like five years after you know, one of these Feed the Future Innovation Lab projects has ended? You know, can we go back after five years and, and see you know, what has been sustained? How have women been empowered? And that is, I guess, a challenge that uh, all of us, both from the research side and from the implementation side, have, because we usually then have to move on uh, to another project. So we have definitely seen on gender um, a lack of learning in terms of coming back a few years after um, an intervention has taken place. So that's something where more effort certainly is needed. Thank you. Um, and a question came in from Nama Raz Yassif, who was hoping that uh, the team here could elaborate on women's preferences for types of technology, manual versus solar, yeah, so, etc. And also, yeah. please talk a little bit about scaling up yeah. the, the technology that was prioritized like by women, but also by men, was solar. Nicole? Um, perhaps for different reasons, but that was the technology that they preferred. Um, the women liked it because it, does, it doesn't require the uh, physical um, labor that, for example, manual pumps require, like pulley and rope and washer can be difficult um, to manage, particularly for kids who have to help with household uh, and domestic water um, collection. Um, but women also preferred the solar because of the fact that it was installed near the household. So women, for example, rope and washer was also installed near the household, and women liked the fact that they could get clean groundwater with rope and washer. But then if you figure in the labor aspect, they preferred solar over it. Um, in terms of scaling, um, what we're doing in this project is looking at how um, the different approaches to irrigation and sort of the different technologies and crop combinations um, can be scaled in different locations. So mapping it based on the suitability of the technology and the crop. Um, and we're also looking at um, you know, the institutions and, and regulatory environment that either enhance or constrain scaling in the different countries where we're working. And one of the things that we're trying to focus on more in these last uh, few months of the project is looking at the private sector role in scaling. Because in most cases, the supply chain for the technologies themselves are underdeveloped in these countries. And developing those supply chains is, you know, it is a, quite a complex process. So we're trying to engage more with the private sector and look at opportunities for, you know, service provision as well as supply chain development. Um, so that is some of the ways that we are looking at the potential for scaling. But in order to look at the potential for scaling, we first had to do this research to understand what fit in what different context. Yeah, I just want to, to add, emphasize again that the context is really important that, you know, although we want to have these silver bullets to figure out how can we reach women and benefit women and empower women and, you know, what are women's preferences, again, I think we have to be careful because in every context the constraints are going to be different, women's schools and agriculture are going to be different, their preferences are going to be different. So um, I think it's important to remember that we need to you know, not only, you know, in our work, in the context that we're working, I think we're getting a better idea, but as these um, interventions are scaled and as other interventions are developed in other places, I think somebody was asking about Latin America, it's important to think about, um, you know, what are the specific preferences women have, what are the specific constraints they have, um, you know, how are gender roles in agriculture, and so um, I just, you know, want people not to leave the webinar thinking that, you know, we, all, we have all the answers and we can solve it today, but that this is a continual uh, learning process as we, we improve, you know, people's access to water through small-scale irrigation. And I think as we, uh, one output that we're developing now, our uh, series of questions that 
practitioners can use to ask uh, the people they're trying to serve what it is that they what it is that they want, um, how they what their household relationships and community relationships are like um, in order to design projects that really meet their needs. Um, I think we've learned a lot through this research about um, ways to ask this question and and domains of uh, you know sharing costs and benefits um, and yeah that's uh, uh, you know will be good for us stay tuned for that basically excellent well I think um, you know, that's a really strong note uh, to to wrap our webinar we've had uh, we've gotten through a lot of our questions and we are actually going to be continuing the questions over on AgriLinks through an AgriLinks discussion. Uh, we'll be sure to post that uh, link in the chat box, but it's also up there on the left of your screen. Um, thank you all for filling out our polls today. They're very helpful to uh, help us look forward to future webinars and figure out what we can do uh, to make the webinar experience better for all of you. Uh, and if you um, are interested in joining the AgriLinks mailing list, please do put your email in the box there on the center of your screen. Uh, the responses are hidden for that question, so it won't be broadcast to everyone, but we can collect your email and make sure that you are uh, aware of any future AgriLinks events and get on our mailing list. All right, I think we were able to tackle um, pretty much all of the questions, but again, click over to AgriLinks if you have more. And I would like to extend a sincere thank you to all of our presenters uh, for joining us today. It was really a, a great presentation. And more importantly, I'd like to extend a thank you to all of you, our participants, um, thank you for the great questions, for the engagement, and for continuing to attend AgriLinks webinars um, and uh, making them you know, worth it for us to help you as much as possible in your work. All right, so we're going to go ahead and sign off, uh, but be on the lookout for the recording in case you'd like to share this with your colleagues. And uh, we will 